his webinar, The State of Trade, Cracking Bullwhips versus Packing Full Ships. I'll say in a minute what we mean by all that. And we also appreciate you uh, helping us roll with the punches as we postponed this from last week. Um, all right. Uh, at the end of the session, we are really committed. I know I say this multiple times. We're going to try and do a Q&A exactly because of the kind of subject matter we have. We're doing Q&A a little bit differently this time than what we've done in past webinars. Um, there's going to be a function called Slido. We're going to drop a link to that in the chat, and you can ask questions through this function. Uh, the questions that you post will only be visible to you and to the Flexport team. Um, we're going to also share a copy of the slide deck at the end of the presentation. All right. Uh, to make the lawyers happy, uh, a brief legal note, please keep in mind that all information provided in this session is based on the situation at the current time and may not be customized to your specific business requirements. We always recommend reaching out to a Flexport expert to discuss your particular situation. Okay, who are we? That's on the next slide. I'm Phil Levy, I'm Chief Economist at Flexport, and joining me is Chris Rogers, our Principal Supply Chain Economist, dialing in from London. Um, good evening, I guess, Chris. Uh, yes, good lunchtime, I suppose. You'd think after three years we got this stuff sorted out, but yeah, there yeah, we go. I don't, I don't know which tea it is, which tea time, high tea. Okay, whatever the case, we got plenty to talk about, so we're going to move on to that. Um, so let me say a bit about where we're going with this uh, and, and give an overview and, and how we structure the whole thing. What we really wanted to tell you was exactly what's going to happen with the US economy and the world economy. We're gonna bring in Europe over the next 12 months so you could go away and with great confidence, make investments, make business plans, get it all sorted. So we thought we'll just look at the data, we'll figure it out, see which direction everything points. And to our consternation, things were pointing in all sorts of different directions. And that's why we framed this the way we have, as the sort of bull whips versus full ships. It's admittedly a sort of logistics perspective on this. Um, bull whips, for those of you who are unfamiliar with this, is a phenomenon which people often talk about when they're thinking about inventories and supply chains, where somebody comes up short, they order more, you build up inventories, they overdo it, you get large inventories, they cut back on orders, and you get a big cyclical swing. So in this case, Bullwhip is standing in for maybe we've overdone it a bit and things are about to slow down. Full ships, of course, is nope, that's what we've been having, that's what we're going to have, things are going ahead full steam. So what we're going to do is we're going to review a whole bunch of the evidence and tell you what we see pointing in which direction. We're going to talk about um, consumption indicators and ask, you know, is the buying binge over? We'll even bring in this morning's release from the... Uh, Bureau of Economic Analysis on Personal Income and Outlays. We will talk about what's happening with inflation and what the Fed might be up to. We will talk about inventories directly. What do we see in the data? Um, what happens if you drill down for particular uh, sectors or trends? If we see it ticking up, what does that actually tell us? Um, we will look then at the unemployment situation uh, and what's, what do we, what's going on with those numbers and what is therefore driving some of the reaction. And then we will close by looking at what's going on with logistics, logistics itself. Um, how well are things moving through the ocean and through the air? And as I said, because this is such a wild time and wild topic, we're gonna to try to be very sure to, to leave space for your questions at the end. All right, we're going to start as we are wont to do by finding out uh, what you all are thinking about. And so to that end, we're going to do a poll. Um, on this particular platform, you will find the poll over on the right-hand side of your screen. There's now a little dot on the poll section. And let me pose the question um, that we're going to ask you. That what we'd like to ask is, um, what will the U.S. economy do over the next 12 months? And here are your options. We're going to have a soft landing. GDP will keep growing. Inflation will fall. Everyone will be happy. Option B. Um, Things are out of control. Inflation's just moving ever upwards. D, hard landing. These rate hikes will work and they'll bring us a recession. D, we're already in a recession and it's just gonna get worse. E, you get to punt. No idea, that's why I'm here. So um, I'll ask you all to uh, fill in your votes. We'll, we'll see what you all think. And of course, then hopefully we'll be giving you useful fodder to, to revise your opinion as we go along. So 
Um, I see lots of votes coming in. I see that you all are as, as perplexed as we are. I guess it would have been disturbing if everybody had settled on exactly the same number. <laughs> um, but uh, but I see, at least for the moment, that the winner is, is neck and neck. Um, optimism is losing badly, but we, we certainly have a majority between, uh, oh, coming around the final bend, it's hard landing, it's hard landing, it's recession. Okay, no, I'm not going to try this. Um, in any case, very close between hard landing and we're already in a recession and it will get worse. All right. We thank you for that. That certainly sets the stage. And I think I'm actually going to end up more, a little more optimistic than you all. So maybe you'll leave here uh, feeling better than you came in. But let's see what, what the data says and, and talk through some of these things and see where we're going. So let's, let's jump right in and let's thank you for the votes on the poll. Let's talk about uh, what's going on with consumption. And there's, and I want to go to our first sort of data slide and, and use this. Um, if we talk about sort of what's happened all along, that the, we're going to show you a bunch of graphs like this. And one of the conventions that you should get used to is that this vertical gray bar, um, that kind of lets you find your place in time. So that marks off what was a recession. So in this case, it was the very brief but very sharp recession that came with the COVID onset. So um, it lasted a couple of months. That's what that time period looks like. So this is kind of a background because one of the things that determines consumption, a, a key determinant of consumption, is how much money do people have in their pockets. And that's what this one is really showing. And it's odd because normally in a recession you would say, well, things slow down and people have less money in their pockets. Look at that line on the top. The top line is real personal income. So you'll see us use the term real frequently. That means we've already adjusted for inflation. Um, we'll show you some inflation figures later, but that becomes particularly important since about the spring of last year, because you'll get very different numbers if you use nominal uh, versus real figures. So here we look at real figures, and that top line doesn't look quite what it's supposed to. In a recession, you normally think that there'd be a big dip, and then we'd recover. Instead, there's no dip whatsoever. In fact, we have a couple of spikes. The lines down below give us some clues where those spikes are coming from because those are real government transfers to individuals. Um, so what we see is we had a number of those spikes. Real personal income never went down to where it was um, pre-pandemic. The spikes themselves have stopped. These came with things like the CARES Act or the American Recovery Program. That is all settled out. So really that that black line is looking fairly tranquil as we go along. And I believe we didn't put in this morning's numbers, but I think that actually stays relatively constant. I'd have to double check on that. Um, so what we see is a couple of things to then close with on this slide. You see that the government transfers is sliding back to where it was pre-pandemic. This is a bit of a question. So we're not pumping money as much into people's pockets. Will that slow consumption down? It might. Now, there's an offsetting effect where people might get higher incomes, and that's where, in, where that can boost the amount of money in their pocket. The other thing is that green line down on the bottom, which is what happened with personal saving. Now, that's certainly dropping quite a bit, but one of the things to note is the big surges in income that came earlier left people with packed bank accounts, not across the, not even across the income spectrum. I believe, obviously, you know, upper quintiles of income did better than and, and have more. But this is one of the things people watch when they're trying to figure out where consumption's going is how much of that spending war chest is still there and at what rate are people willing to, to spend it out. So the bottom line that you take from this picture is we haven't really seen sort of crashing incomes or anything of that sort which would presage a big drop in consumption. So this looks a little bit more like steady as she goes. Would you would you concur with that, Chris? Yeah, I think I think that is um, what you're seeing from the incomes. I, I think when we look at um, other parts of the world, um, there is an issue that they a lot of the government spending schemes weren't as generous as they were in the U.S. and they didn't go straight in the bank account. So, for example, there's concerns in the U.K. already that like people's savings are being run down pretty rapidly. You know, we're not seeing uh, pay rises, certainly not in real terms, 
Um, so, so yeah, I, I'd probably be watching that green line because that, that's a sign of where people will start to panic a bit. We've got a slide later on on, on the consumer confidence, but uh, yeah, absolutely. You know, total incomes barely moved, compensation up a little bit. Yeah, pretty balanced. Yeah, and that's so it's, it's a very good point that this differs from country to country, but but this is one of the things we watch is to see do people have money? And you're right, this is your your point about real incomes not going up in the UK, they have it in the US either. Um, that one of the things we've seen, we've started to see very rapid wage growth. We'll talk about that, but we have not yet really seen that, you know, push the, that income bar upwards. So, so far it's stasis. Let's go to the next slide. And um, the next one is going to talk about, all right, we talk about what sets the stage for consumption. Here's what's happening in consumption. And we got up early this morning to make sure that this would be updated and have the freshest, hottest data for you, which unfortunately, at least for the top line, the blue line looks like this sharp downward jag at the end. Let me first set this up and then we'll talk about uh, why we have a droopy blue line. Um, so this is trying to look at the major components of consumption, of personal consumption, and to allow for easy comparison and reference to where we were pre-pandemic, we normalize everything. So even though these sectors are, are not at all the same size, services is much bigger than the non-durables, non-durables is significantly bigger than durables. The way we do it here is that for February of 2020, everything equals 100. So now you can look at the, the movements from there. What you see with this, there's a sharp downward movement in the onset of the recession. Again, that vertical gray bar timing that for you. And then, um, the point I like to make about this graph, only services behaves the way we would have expected a recession and recovery to look, where you get a sharp drop and then a gradual recuperation to the point where I think we've just exceeded the, the, in real terms, again, where we were on the eve of the recession. Those of you who have been experiencing congestion in logistics and you know seeing the, the, the packed ships, as it were, the top two lines tell you where that's coming from. Because after that initial downturn, we saw an extraordinary binge of goods consumption. And that's why we set this up this way, so that you can actually see that mapped out. The, the blue line is looking at durables. This is saying that by the time we got to spring of last year, durables consumption was up 35% over where it had been pre-pandemic. Um, that's not inflation, remember, this is already adjusted. That's an incredible surge, and those things all need to move in containers. And there were a lot of containers and a lot of ships and things got very congested and prices went way up. Um, what have we seen since then? Well, we've seen it ease off that peak. As we know, we weren't really stoking the income fires uh, the same way after that. It's eased off. One of the things that means is in general, if you look at year over year numbers on consumption, they look pretty grim because we, we've dropped off that peak. There's another way to look at this and, and in fact, now I'll get to the end of that blue line. Um, the the number this morning was that durable goods consumption, real terms, had dropped something like 3.5% in a month, which sounds really quite alarming. There's another way to look at this, which is something from you know the middle of last summer, around July of 21, we've been holding at durable goods consumption about 20% above where it was pre-pandemic. It goes up, it goes down a little bit, but it has fairly held fairly even. And actually, if you look at non-durables consumption, it has gone down ever so slightly, but again, actually that one looking from about February of 21, it's been holding at 10 to 12% above where it was pre-pandemic. In relative terms, these are looking worse relative to services, but, the, uh, but this doesn't look like a plunge in consumption. It looks more like a plateau um, and an easing off from the, the, the real boom of last spring. Um, Chris, thoughts on this one? Yeah, so actually I'm really worried about this one because whilst it's not moved very much, it's still 20% above where it was pre-pandemic. So if, big if, if we see a return to pre-pandemic spending levels, that's a 20% drop in real spending on durables. And we'll talk about logistics um, later on, but bear in mind durables are really, really big and non-durables are really, really small. So there's going to be like an outsized impact on the amount of shipping going on as that durables number comes down. 
So, yeah. so really, really the biggest the technical definition, it's lasting three years or longer, but I think it correlates really well. It does, yeah, yeah, absolutely. So, um, yeah, I was bringing some alternative uh, economic nomenclature there for you, Phil. <laughs> Appreciate that. All right, good. Well, and so the, you're right. This is an interesting, this is something we've tried to track. By the way, the other reason why we had focused on this was that if you look to the left of those gray bars, you look at our pre-pandemic era, this was nowhere near so exciting that you saw a fairly constant balance, a ratio between goods and services spending. So one of the things we've been watching for is when does that ratio come together? Of course, a ratio can come together in a couple of different ways. You can either take the top line and have it come down or the bottom line can come up. Let's go to the next slide and see what we've been looking at with this. Um, so this is exactly that. It's, it's looking at that ratio, it's scaled a bit. We don't have time to get into the, the details of how it's scaled, but suffice it to say that we, we've done it so that zero would be a return to where we were pre-pandemic. Um, this is our post-COVID indicator where we're trying to, and the, the virtue of looking at this one is it doesn't stop in the recent month. It actually goes several months forward um, because we're actually forecasting this out. And what you see here is a forecast not updated for today's numbers, but in which we actually had already been forecasting that non-durable goods were falling more into line with the, the traditional ratios that we've seen. Durable goods, we actually did show a bit of a downturn. I don't know if it was quite as extreme as what we actually saw, but this is things drifting back to the normal ratio. But a reminder, that can happen because services um, are going up, or because goods are going down. Either one would kind of get us back to, to that earlier ratio. Um, all right, now let's go, let's go ahead and look at um, what Chris had, had uh, foreshadowed a little bit earlier, um, what we're seeing in terms of consumer and industrial confidence. So on the next slide, please. Um, all right, Chris, this doesn't look good. What are we looking at here? Yeah, so there's two lines on here. The black line is from the University of Michigan. Uh, it's their consumer um, expectations. So basically, really, you didn't do confident... Michigan in blue. No, I missed that opportunity. It's right. uh, but it's indigo blue. It's not quite the right color. Maybe, maybe for next time, I'll uh, put a little uh, mask we'll, on we'll there for on you it. as well. we'll work on it. Yeah. Um, but look, the dotted the dotted line is the past ten years average expectation. So you'd normally expect it to kind of swing up and down a bit, up and down a bit, and we've actually seen it collapse. So consumer confidence is a kind of decadal, if that's a word, it is now um, the lowest it's been in, in many, many years. Um, manufacturing import uh, expectations aren't quite as low yet. So this is saying, look, you know, right now, next month or so, that's the purple line, pretty much in line with its, its long-term average. So manufacturers in the US aren't planning on cutting back their imports yet, but consumers are, are pretty negative. Um, if we go to the next slide, this is the same thing um, but for the uh, US, uh, excuse me, for the, the EU. Um, uh, unhelpfully, I've not colorized these right. So the blue line in this instance is consumer confidence. Um, but it's to make the point that consumer confidence in the EU, the only time since 1985 that it's been lower than this was actually in the depths of the pandemic. So, you know, I think, and, and I'd also note like how quickly that turnaround has come really, you know, late last year was was when the rot began to set in. So, you know, consumers have turned really quite negative really quite quickly. And so they might not have changed spending behavior yet, um, but but the confidence has certainly evaporated. I don't know what you think of that, Phil, whether that's like a causal thing that we've seen in the past or or whether this is just people responding to surveys. No, I think it's a, it's a really interesting question. And on some of them, I don't know the EU numbers as well as I know the US numbers, but they'll do breakdowns and they'll ask people, which parts are you responding to and what do you actually think about? And they'll, they'll do distinctions between what do you see as your current situation and where do you think things will be either in one year or three years or the future? And I think it raises an interesting point, which is again, maybe the reason why we focus on this, which is many of these things can be self-fulfilling. That if you know, you've heard news, you're worried about inflation, you're worried about if you're in the EU, you're worried about whether you're gonna have gas, to, to heat your homes next winter. Um, you may say, these are difficult times, I'm pulling back. And if you do that, that can of course then have a self-fulfilling effect because if everybody pulls back, then you start seeing things like consumption numbers 
drop sharply. So I think that there's been a lot of news. I, I, I heard I think this is baseless. And where I have seen people specify what's driving this, it often comes especially from things like inflation forecasts and inflation numbers. Yeah, absolutely. And in fact, if you go to the next slide, that self-fulfilling prophecy thing you can actually see. So this is uh, retail trade, uh, real terms, excluding food, fuel and autos. And effectively, it's the sequential change month on month and uh, seasonally adjusted. And you can see here in the EU, we actually saw a drop in retail sales, particularly stark in Germany, which, as you mentioned, are where they've got rapidly rising costs, particularly for natural gas. So, you know, to a certain extent in Europe, retail sales have already turned over. And as you say, those those surveys can be broken down. And the EU survey it was absolutely um, inflation that was the uh, the biggest issue. We should talk about inflation. We should. Good idea. Let's go to inflation. Um, we're, we're breezing along because, like I said, we do want to get to Q&A and there's so much to talk about. Um, all right. So what can we say about inflation? Well, let's look to see what it looks like. We'll go to the next slide, please. Um, yeah, we, we've crossed out transitory. That's old news. Although I would note, if you look at what the Fed says, they don't use the word transitory anymore. If you are a geek and you say, hey, I think I'll read the Fed's statement of economic projections, uh, it says transitory. Not in so many words, I'm paraphrasing, but essentially says inflation is going to go away. So one of the tricky things about talking about inflation is we've got a whole bunch of different measures. It's not a single thing. It, it's which basket you pick. And there's um, popular ones like the PCE, which just got updated this morning. I believe it came in at 6.3% again for the full number of 4.7. For if you take out things at, like uh, food and energy, which are often volatile. Um, but what we show in this graph is we show four different measures. We have the producer price index, the consumer price index, um, a the, the personal consumption expenditures index, that's the green line. And then there's a really modest one, which actually happens to be the Fed's favorite, which is a variant called personal consumption expenditures trimmed mean, where they take out what they see as the volatile bits on either end, either the things that seem to move up an awful lot or down an awful lot. And they look at what they see as their version of the core. You also hear core expenditures. All right. So we're not going to be helping you select among these now because actually each one of them tells a different story and you, you can work something out which is why we show first thing i would note is that, that i take from this graph is that we actually can kind of date when this got to be an issue that if, if you look at this graph up until you know say the start of 2021 there's really nothing very impressive going on here right you you had a dip in some things especially producer prices but basically flat and or actually hanging out roughly around, they all kind of converge right around 2%, which, not coincidentally, is right where most of the central banks want it to be. Most of them don't actually target zero inflation, they target 2% inflation. So if you're looking at this um, a year and a half ago, it kind of looks like everything's going swimmingly. This, this is fine on the, on the price front. And then we see things really shoot up. Um, and this was the bit where transitory was the hypothesis that the uh, the idea was, yeah, it shoots up a bit and it's going to drop back down on its own. And it hasn't so much. We do see things kind of leveling off. One of the big concerns here is that as we talk about things like food and energy, and as you look at the stuff um, that you see there on the top line, the producer price index, these are often things that feed in to future production, to future costs, and then, and they don't really, when you see numbers that high, it's not really presaging a big drop off. Um, the theory, I think, of the drop off was understandable. It was the stuff we looked at a little bit earlier, like the durables, where you were going to get a big surge. And hey, once you've bought all the sofas and TV sets and exercise bikes that you can buy, you're set for a few years, it's going to ease up. Well, as we showed, it hasn't quite. Um, and so we've seen this sort of very steady thing. And of course, in the midst of this, um, we are you doing separate EU inflation later, Chris, or yes. should we talk about EU yes, inflation right, right now? Uh, we can touch on it a little bit later. I've got the, the chart later. Yeah, on we'll, we'll do it a bit later. So let's just say for the, for the US part, um, you, you see a fair bit of persistence and we haven't really seen the drop off. Let me talk a bit about where this is coming from and what's going on with the Fed changes, because I think a lot of times for those of you who think either we have a recession or that the recession's right around the corner, it's going to be alarming news about the Fed that may have triggered some of this. So let's go to the next slide. 
if we want to talk about what the US Fed has been doing, there's really two components to this. Um, this is the first component. It's, it's sort of the, the unusual component, which is quantitative easing. They didn't always call it that. But this was, the Fed was faced with a problem around the time of the, the pandemic onset, which is that they could take interest rates, their, their Fed funds rate down to zero, and I'll show that in a second. But once you get to zero, what are you supposed to do? Well, the EU actually had an answer for that um, on rates, which is zero, why is that a problem? Let's go below. Um, but in terms of the Fed, they said, you know what we're gonna do? We're gonna expand our balance sheet. We're gonna go out and buy bonds. And when the Fed buys bonds, it creates money. And so what this chart shows is the tally that essentially you had a Fed balance sheet that it has a, is the different components, whereas US treasuries, mortgage backed and a little bit of other. Um, but essentially the balance sheet on the eve of the pandemic was about $4 trillion. And the peak got to be about $9 trillion. All right, you see that it kind of curves off there at the end and, and sort of flattens. These were the announcements we had several months ago that when the Fed, the Fed had said that before they did anything on interest rates, they were gonna stop this program. Stopping this program did not mean selling everything off and getting to $4 trillion. Stopping meant we're not, we're gonna cease the purchases that were making this go up. And then we're gonna do that gradually. So we're gonna buy a little less, then a little less, then a little less. That's where you see that slope flatten. We have not really had the Fed slam the brakes on quantitative easing. You see that this sort of plateaus at the top. I think it was just last week that, it, that they maybe let some bonds mature and so the overall numbers may have nudged down ever so slightly. But for the most part, this is still pretty expansionary. We have a very you know, generously expanded uh, balance sheet. It is also, as a technical point, you see that big blue section on mortgage back assets. The way the Fed is trying to let these things go is it says when they mature, then it won't necessarily renew them. That, for some technical reasons that we can talk about if somebody is, is really eager and puts it in the Q&A, um, that doesn't happen so much with mortgage-backed bonds in a period of rising interest rates. So how much this is going to fall off is a question. Let's go on and look then at um, the next slide where I'm going to get to the conventional thing, which has been making the headlines, which is the effective Fed funds rate. Now, one thing to note on this, we've scaled this chart. We've done it so that you can see all the movements really vividly, but it means that the top line here is 2.5%. The expectation is that if we look at these things in a year or so, that top line is gonna be more like 4%, 5% to fit in what we're talking about. But I'll note that these are still pretty low numbers. But let me, okay, I'm getting ahead of myself. What we saw was on the eve of the pandemic, the Fed funds rate had gone up, but it actually come down a little bit right before. So we were not at a very high number. We were at about 1.5% on the Fed funds rate. And then what you see is during the pandemic, Fed drops it to zero. Because we're gonna have zero interest rates. And it held there up until quite recently. Then we had a couple of 50 basis, well, 25 basis point hike, basis point being 25 basis points is a quarter of a percentage point. Um, so we had 25 basis points, then 50, and then we had a 75 basis point hike. So you see that this actually gets us right back, it would seem, to where we were on the eve of the pandemic. Um, however, there's another way to look at this. And so let's go to the next slide. And that, that'll give us the other way to look at this. This is, the, the previous slide showed the thing that you read about in the newspapers or your you know, online updates, which were, what is the announced Fed funds rate? This does this in real terms and subtracts off what's the inflation rate. Um, so, which I would argue is economically more meaningful. I would also, if you don't trust me on that, that take it from the Fed. That's what the Fed will talk about. They will say that they see a neutral rate as a zero to one percent real Fed funds rate. Well, here's our version of the real Fed funds rate. This is not official, but what we do is we subtract off the most conservative of those inflation measures we showed you, the trimmed mean PCE. And what you see is that we actually have an, an aggressively stimulative monetary policy at the moment. It's turned around a little bit, but we're looking at something like a negative three and a half percent real Fed funds rate. Maybe that's blipped up to more like negative three. Anything negative is seen, certainly seen as stimulative. So what this would argue is the Fed has quite a ways to go before it even gets to neutral. So we really can't talk about the Fed having slammed on the brakes. The really key question is as we look forward, 
how does it get to that neutral range that it has told us it wants to get to? Um, the, there's two ways that can happen. One, inflation subsides on its own. That's the transitory idea. So you, you, you know, go up very modestly with the nominal federal funds rate and inflation slides in nicely below it. Or inflation looks persistent and then you need to keep hiking interest rates until you get ahead of inflation. Um, that's a very big question. Um, and we'll, but that, that's a lot of what people are uncertain about uh, going forward. I would argue that we're more likely to have the latter than the former. Chris, maybe you can say a bit about what we've been seeing with inflation in the EU, which has had some different driving mechanisms, right? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I mean, if you go to uh, the next slide, please. Th this is basically consumer prices, uh, CPI equivalent um, in, the, uh, in the euro area. So the black line is the euro area. Inflation currently a little bit below 8%. If you take the EU 27 overall, it's a little bit over 8%, and, and that's been dragged up by um, the Netherlands, um, some of the Eastern European countries, and this is before a lot of the recent increase in natural gas prices linked to the conflict in Ukraine have really um, taken effect. Now, one of the reasons we've got the different countries on here is that it shows that the job of the European Central Bank to try and manage inflation is way more complicated than it is for the Fed. So, you know, Fed, one country, one fiscal system, you know, lots of differences at the state level, I know. But the ECB is trying to wrangle 27 different economies at the same time. And, you know, as a consequence of which, there's a, a much bigger risk that either the ECB, like, doesn't tighten enough and inflation stays high, or it tightens too much because it, it's trying to manage, you know, the, the peripheral countries rather than the core countries down. So, you know, that, that's a lot of volatility, a lot of uncertainty. Um, I would say, um, you know, th this whole business about when will the percentage inflation rate come down is important because once we hit kind of November time, you're then comparing year over year to a period when commodity prices were already coming up. So the inflation rate might come down, but that doesn't mean that prices are coming down. It just means you're, you're seeing a statistical anomaly there. And before we leave inflation, my my least favorite fact at the moment, uh, UK inflation is currently 9%. The last time UK inflation was 9% was in the early 90s, and interest rates then were 15, 15%. So that's 10 times higher than they are right now. So to your point, Phil, about will central banks need to kind of, you know, push over towards having proper tightening rates, they yeah, I, I guess my concern there is that interest rates, whether it's in the UK, the, the euro area or the US, could have a lot further to go than maybe people realize. Yeah. So, so one big thing to watch is do you get sort of a happy situation where inflation comes down on its own? Or do we see something like you said, where you relive that early 90s experience and we get very high nominal rates? Um, the other thing that I would, as we're sort of leaving people with takeaways on this, um, that to me, there's a very big question about food and energy, that they, food and energy are often sort of pushed off to the side, not because we don't care about them, but because frequently it's, well, they're volatile, they hop up and down, but they're hopping up and down around the same mean, and therefore they're not good forecasters. Let's look at core inflation indices, and that's what we'll really care about. I think there's a question here, and, and Chris, you've got energy expertise in this, whether is this food and energy hopping around or is this something secular where you're seeing, I mean, the, the, the energy price numbers that come out of Europe are astonishing um, in terms of how fast that inflation has been. And then one sees stories about things like, well, remember, if uh, if you, you have a shortage of gas, you look at German industry, for example, that often gas is an input that is sort of starts these production processes, um, not just, you know, the also important rule of heating people's homes. There's a question of whether those things as inputs feed into lots of other things, whether, you know, and with the food sector, whether you're, you're having uh, various things that sort of go into fertilizer and, and, and other stuff. Any thoughts on, on that and on this forecast of, is that going to be something passing or a, a persistent worry and a cause? Yeah, so so we wrote a lot about natural gas. Um, if you go to our website, flexport.com slash research, um, in the Ukraine conflict section, we, we wrote about natural gas um, a little while ago. You're, you're absolutely right that natural gas is an input for the uh, petrochemical industry and the plastic industry uh, in the US, actually, as well as in, um, in Europe, as particularly an issue for, for Germany. Um, and so, you know, yeah, that, there is that feed through. I think it is secular as well as cyclical because 
what a lot of the European Union countries now want to do is reduce their gas exposure and their energy exposure more broadly to uh, Russia. And obviously, if there were cheaper sources of gas out there, we'd already be buying them. So moving somewhere else for your gas is going to cost more. So I think it is inevitable that you will see kind of a, a higher price for natural gas. For oil, the jury's out of it because there are you know lots of different sources of oil. And if Europe buys less Russian oil, China will buy more. So you might you know you might see a, a balancing out there. Um, but you know we're we're looking at really a process of at least a couple of years for this to balance out. The other point as well, of course, is that Europe's trying to decarbonize its economy more broadly, and that's going to come with costs as well. So, yeah, I think energy generally is is just becoming more expensive over time. Yeah, and but that that's an input cost, of course, which then yeah. tends to be one of those predictors of where where goods costs yeah. come out later. All right, lots of yeah. interesting stuff to watch there. We've been talking a lot. We want to hear a little bit of what you think. We also want to turn to this topic of um, inventories because. Remember, that was part of our premise of the whole bullwhip effect, that one of the things that we wanted to ask about was, are we seeing this? Are we seeing a big buildup in inventories? And Chris is going to give us a rundown on this in a second. But first, for those of you who are aware of what your company might be doing, we want to know what your experience has been like. So um, here's some potential responses for you. You could say, we've deliberately increased our inventory for general precautionary reasons. Or we've deliberately increased our inventory because we're worried about supply chain interruptions. or our inventory has gone up more than we wanted as sales have slowed. Or we'd like to have more inventory than we do, but we can't find the space. Finally, we offer you, we'd like to have more inventory than we do, but we can't get the goods. So um, so then let me, oh, I see we're already getting quite a few uh, votes in there, um, but would, be, would welcome your feedback. What are you all seeing out there? Um, what is the, the mix? What is the balance? Um, it's one of those things where we can sort of watch the aggregate numbers, but the motivations are fascinating and knowing, you know, where you are on this. And actually, I'm, it looks like there's quite a split um, with, with sort of different responses on this. Uh, let me give this a moment more. Thank you for those of you who have voted. Um, for those of you who haven't yet, um, take your best guess, see which answer is closest, and we'll, we'll see what we come up with. Um, all right. So at the moment... We have a narrow plurality winner with our inventory has gone up more than we wanted as sales have slowed. Um, but a close second behind this is we've deliberately increased our inventory because we're worried about supply chain interruptions. Chris, what have you been seeing on, on inventories? And thank you for again for everyone who's voted. Yeah, thanks everyone. So I think the, the important point here actually is that 70% um, of people here at, well, in fact, more, 77% have said, the inventories have gone up. And I think that's an important differentiator to where we were if we had this call several months ago where like inventories were low, the shelves were empty, like you know, nobody had got anything for anything. Um, if we skip on to the next slide, please. Um, what we've done is a whole bunch of analysis. And again, you can find this on the website where we've looked at macroeconomic statistics and then we've drilled down to um, corporate statistics. And I whiz through this pretty quickly so that we can we can get to your questions. But um, this slide is showing you US, U.S. wholesale inventories. So this is basically what's on hand at central distributors rather than what's like in the stores that you see. And we're looking at inventory to sales. So this is basically the ratio of what's in the warehouse versus um, what's actually being sold in a given time period. Um, the total on the left hand side in 2019, roughly speaking, for all companies in the U.S., the inventory to sales ratio was about 1.4 times. Um, that dropped during the um, uh, during the pandemic and because of the boom in um, uh, boom in demand that we saw. Um, but it started to pick back up and we're not back to the pre pandemic period yet. And that's why you'll see kind of this confidence that, OK, we're going to continue to see more activity because inventories are going to be rebuilt. It's all coming through. When you actually drill down into the numbers, what you actually find is that um, for many sectors, we're actually already above that pre-pandemic level. So in this chart, the purple bar is where we were in April. And you know, we're already seeing there that for some of those durable sectors, particularly hardware, um, and also for some of the non-durable sectors, apparel, we're already a long way um, above the pre-pandemic level. We had a question um, come in at, um, already about some specific names. We're not going to talk about specific companies, but I think, you know, generically speaking, you can see that there's very different experiences going on 
in in different industries. Um, perhaps Phil, just to step back a little bit, you talk about how kind of inventory activity plays into kind of GDP and economic growth more broadly. Phil, what, uh, let's see. Oh, how in GDP? I think um, you know it, it's the sort of transmission mechanism of all of this. And you'll often see it in GDP numbers, where um, we, we've seen some. In fact, it was a when we had the, the big downturn number for Q1. The the one of the big things that was going on that was you had actually seen an inventory adjustment, and people had taken heart that despite the big downturn, if you sort of set those inventory things aside, consumption and investment looked reasonably strong. So it is one of the intermediating factors. Um, but but again, the, the motives can be hard to read. Yeah, and actually, if we talk about motives for a second, um, if we um, so so we ask the question. If you go to the next slide, um, we ask the question about like, can you can you store it? We'd like to have more, but we can't. Uh, but we we can't find the space. Um, not many people said that that was the case. Although when we look at what's going on with warehouse pricing, uh, which is what this chart is showing, it it has kind of increased pretty steadily last year. It, it stabilized more recently, but you know warehouse pricing is is still very high, so that might be kind of a challenge for for companies that have got um, these higher inventories. And it's not just a U.S. issue. If we go to the next slide, um, we can see like the same um, sort of figures for the EU. Now, in this instance, um, what we're seeing is the balance of stocks of finished goods, where zero is effectively we're adequate, and anything below zero is we're short. For the EU overall, um, you can see there that actually we've seen a recovery more or less to within striking distance of adequate. Um, I put Germany and the Netherlands on there because Germany's very focused on heavy industry, and so heavy industry clearly is still undersupplied. Um, whilst in the Netherlands, which is more focused on um, commerce and retail, um, they're already well above um, that level. Now, what we've also done is take a look at financial data. Um, it's on the next slide. We've taken a look at 1,400 companies quoted on the New York Stock Exchange and the NASDAQ. And what we can see there is that the rate of change in inventories versus the rate of change in revenues has swapped over. So that gray bar, which was negative for several quarters during the pandemic, has now switched to positive. So inventories are increasing uh, quite significantly more quickly than they are for uh, for revenues. And in fact, for some companies now, and we're about to start the second quarter earnings season, we're actually going to see revenues um, turn into uh, negative territory. Um, so, so a contraction in, in revenues year over year. Um, the last slide in this section actually looks at, so the next slide is looking at this inventory to sales ratio again, based on corporate data over the past decade or so. So for the first quarter of the year, um, how do inventory to sales look over time? Um, the black line, uh, the black bar is 2022. The purple line is 2011 to 2019. What we're seeing there again is that uh, for five out of eight sectors, we're already seeing inventories back at or above the pre-pandemic level. And in retail specifically, which is the right-hand cluster of bars, they all are um, except for e-commerce. So putting aside the e-commerce firms, most regular stores have already pretty much fill, refilled their um, their inventories versus their sales. And so we see a downturn in sales, which is perfectly possible given what we've been discussing so far, then you know, there's there's already too many inventories there. And that of course will mean that we'll see a lot less shipping relatively quickly. Anyway, that's a, a quick fly through on, on inventories, Phil. I don't know if there's anything to, no, to that's add good. And if it, We're not quite doing it just as you have in other writing and I would recommend people go and read that. But I think what we take as a bottom line from this is if we were thinking about the sort of bullwhip effect, this is where the evidence comes from a bit, is that you, you're seeing an inventory rebuild, particularly if you focus on certain sectors and you do a nice breakdown here. But the story that one would take from this is this could be taken as an indicator of a slowdown to come, that as you get a bigger you know, inventories at, at higher levels, fewer orders and, and slower, uh, slower production going forward, right? Yep. All right, so let's do a contrast. Let's, let's now move ahead and say, all right, you know, if that sort of convinces you that things are slowing down, here's why we're a little bit befuddled. We're, our section on everyone has a job, nobody's happy. So let's see how many people have jobs. Next slide, please. Um, 
if you do, so the, the, the measures of the job market that you're probably most familiar with are things like what is the U.S. unemployment rate if you're based in the U.S. and you're at you know, whatever is 3.6, 3.8%. Um, it's been hovering in that range, which seems extraordinarily low, but there's some of these measures which actually make the market look tighter than that. And there's some economic research which argues that these measures are actually more relevant. So I'm gonna give you a couple of numbers here and we're, we're showing you charts that put things into a longer perspective so you can see how historically tight the US labor market is. So the chart on the left, uh, what are the things about an unemployment number? I'll just say this is a lovely number, wonderful, easy to follow, but it depends on a couple of things. You're only unemployed officially if you are out looking for a job. If you've decided that you've had enough of all that, you know, and you're not going to look, you're frustrated or you're retired or whatever, you do not count as unemployed. The chart on the left accounts for that because it's actually looking at employment to population ratio. So it gets out of this question of, you know, are you trying, are you trying hard and so forth. And it also restricts itself to the age range 25 to 54 to largely set aside the demographic question of, you know, did somebody decide to retire, retire early or so forth. And what we see is that we are at one of the tightest points that we've been at in about 20 years. That we, there was stuff earlier, and that may have had to do with you know various demographic things and things moving in the labor force. But if you look at about the last 20 years, the peak of employment to population has come right around 80 percent. You see that we had this enormous drop in this. That was the depth of the of the COVID pandemic, which far exceeded what we had had in earlier recessions, those earlier gray bars. But we're really pretty much back there. The second chart in this graph. I think is even more striking, which is it's a different way of measuring tightness, which is you have a listing of how many job openings are there, and you also have a uh, listing of how many people are listed as unemployed. What is the ratio of those? How many job openings are there per unemployed person? If you look prior to the COVID pandemic, you saw this was a number that would swing at its worst, you know, it was more like 0.2 that was right after the global financial crisis. At its best, it was around 1.2 that was actually right on the eve of the um, of the COVID pandemic. But that was about the range it moved in. And so you could see, and even with the global financial crisis, it was a dip down from about, what, 0.7 to about 0.2. And then, a, you know, it took a few years, but it rebounded. We're now at about two. Two jobs per unemployed person so this is an extraordinary level of tightness for the this. What 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 does that mean? Um, well, one thing it means you'd think people would be happy about this. Chris is going to give some evidence on this later. But a second thing it means is people like Larry Summers have argued we've never seen anything this tight without wage pressures. And anecdotally, we hear stories about wage pressures. We if you look at the Atlanta Fed wage tracker, it's showing wages increasing not quite at the inflation rate. But that's what this stuff tends to presage. Often people are on contracts where it gets renewed. You hear certain companies like a large airline, for example, that reaches a new labor contract with sort of fairly large numbers. So this is the tightness. This does not look like a recession. You can see what the recessions look like because the recessions are the gray bars. This stuff is kind of plunging, going down, very low numbers. We are as far away from that as we have experienced. All right, next slide, please. Unless, Chris, you wanted to comment on the U.S., but you can tell us what it looks like in the EU. Yeah, I'll, I'll talk about the EU. So I think I've used the simple number here because I'm, I'm a slightly simpler economist than, than Phil. But, and also Eurostat's not great in terms of getting those figures. But more importantly, what we're seeing, the black line here is um, unemployment in the EU 27 in total. And it hasn't been this low. Well, I've got data going back here to January 20, uh, 2002. Not been that low since then. Um, but Back to that point you made earlier about the difficulty ECB will have in terms of managing a soft landing. You look at the difference in rates across different countries and how that shifted over time. So back in 2006, unemployment in Germany was above the European average. Now it's way, way, way below the European average. And that's partly because there's been some significant labor reforms over that period brought in by uh, Chancellor Schroeder and then developed by Chancellor Merkel. Um, that's changed the nature of the labor market. Spain, on the other hand, has gone the other way. Inflation, uh, excuse me, unemployment used to be well below the EU average. Now it's well above the EU average. And that's a lot to do with 
kind of systemic changes in how the Spanish economies worked. And a lot of that unemployment is uh, amongst younger people. So you know, there's a, a difference in the in the mix there. But you know, key point: very, very low um, unemployment uh, rates in the EU. Um, so similar pressures you'd you'd expect in in terms of wages. Now, question is: a how sustainable that unemployment is? Because you know, frankly put, if we start to see uh, companies laying staff off, if we start to see a downturn, that could turn around uh, relatively quickly. Um, and are people actually getting a pay rise? So if you look at the next chart, we've already shown you this chart, but you know, effectively what I've done here um, is put side by side US consumer sentiment and the EU consumer sentiment. You can see how they've both broken below their 10 year averages quite significantly. Um, you know, question here is, is it because people have got a job and they don't like the job they've got because it's not paying enough or are they worried they might lose that job? Um, or are they just worried about the state of the world um, in general? For me, on the EU side, when you break into those numbers, it's largely because of concerns about inflation, i.e. you've got a job, it's just not paying enough, and concerns about the state of the uh, economy over the next 12 months, i.e. will I still have this job that doesn't pay me enough in 12 months' time? Um, I guess for the US, the, the, the shift has been more stark. I don't know if that's because Americans were more optimistic in the first place. Well, it's interesting. You look, and we showed earlier that it was right around the the beginning of uh, of 2021 that inflation was really coming on. This at least correlates well. That doesn't necessarily give us causality, but I think you're right. I think you, you have that concern. And and to wrap this section, I would say it encapsulates part of the contradictions that we're looking at. That you know, we would normally have said that whether it's for the EU or for the US, really tight labor markets like this, the historically good unemployment numbers should be cause for celebration and should very much be the full ships, full speed ahead. But these kind of concerns uh, sort of temper that a bit. And then it, there's a question of what this means for the response. Why don't we move on from here? Because we, we vowed, a solemn vow to get to questions. Uh, but we don't want to skip the question of what's been happening with, with freight. So Chris, do you want to talk us through this? Uh, you promised to get to questions. I didn't. Uh, no, we will uh, get through it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so, so look. Um, when you look at trade activity, um, and this is the, the Flexport Trade Activity Forecast or TAF, um, you know, the expectation is that you know, we're going to see trade go up and up, which of course it will because commodity prices are up, inflation's up, um, you know, that's driven up uh, trade activity more broadly. Now, clearly the, the question comes like if we take inflation out of these numbers, what does the world look like? And if we go to the next slide, what you'll see here is we've taken activity at the nine biggest ports and looked at how that's changed over time. So effectively, the gray lines are the history. The light gray line is 2017 to 2019. 2020 uh, obviously had disruptions early in the year because of the pandemic. 2021, actually, you know, demand was pretty constant or use of ports, I should say, was pretty constant um, throughout the uh, throughout the year. And it's important to note that that means there wasn't a peak season uh, or even an off-peak season where systems could adjust. The green line is 2022. And what you can see there is that certainly up until May, we didn't see a downturn in shipping activity. Where we might have started to see a downturn is in June. Now, for June, this is just um, an estimated data point based on the first half of the month. So it's by no means conclusive. And these are all days adjusted numbers, by the way. So there's a very small sign that we might possibly have started to see some sort of downturn um, in freight activity, but we're certainly not seeing yet a, a wholesale reversal, um, and we're certainly not seeing a, um, um, you know, a, a significant move to you know, some doomsday scenario of below pre-pandemic levels yet. But clearly, you know, things could change. Um, the next slide is just talking about kind of freight rates um, more more generally. Um, the left hand chart is showing you um, the domestic freight rate for the United States across all modes. And you can see that we have seen a drop off very recently. That would imply that um, you know, there's a, either a drop in demand or an acceleration in supply. Um, the right hand chart is international container shipping rates. Uh, the purple line there is shipping from China to the US West Coast. And what we can see there is there was a bit of a drop at the start of the year. But there's been a little bit of a pickup since. 
And you know, it's worth bearing in mind with all of this that there's been a variety of um, uh, disruptions caused to supply chains, whether that's lockdowns in Asia or the the, the long established kind of gumming up of of the ports. Um, but you know, there are there are concern, concerns about freight uh, freight rates going on there. Um, next slide is our our timeliness indicators. Phil, do you want to talk a little bit about those? Yeah, I'd be happy to. The other thing I was going to note on all of this, and we are breezing through a lot of stuff kind of quickly, particularly these, Chris pulls together very nicely in a logistics pressure matrix. So you can find all of these indicators on our website. We will also have these charts for you. But you have a logistics pressure matrix, not just for the US, but now also for Europe as well, that we have sort of a, two separate logistics pressure matrices that are updated weekly as new information comes in. So on this one, this is our measure of how long does it take to get stuff, um, whether you're doing it by ocean on the left or air on the right. And so for ocean, this is from cargo ready, when it's cargo ready in Asia, and we show two different trade lanes. There's the far east westbound, uh, which is the, the darker, that's from Asia to Europe. And then there's the bluish one, which is the trans-Pacific eastbound from Asia to North America. Um, what do we see here? We see that, Overall, it's up. We're nowhere near back to where we were pre-pandemic. We see that it has improved quite a bit of late, but that's kind of gotten us back to where we were in the summer or fall of last year. Um, the other curious thing that I keep a wary eye on is this is not the first time that we've had a spike and a pullback. If you look, that's happened rather regularly, and then it's been followed by a new upturn. So I think the m next few months are going to be very interesting that way as we move towards what's traditional peak season. Do we do that again? Do we then start moving back up? This is really the full ships part of things. Or does this continue going down, which is what it would look like if we're really getting a recovery and a move away from the kind of congestion we've seen um, to the pandemic? And on the right, I won't uh, say a great deal about it, but this is a similar measure for air where we've also seen an improvement. We're also not quite where we were pre-pandemic, but we are perhaps closer than we are on, on the ocean side. All right. Should we do the next slide? Oh, because the next slide, I should note, those earlier things that you saw tend to be the end of a full journey. And if that's a journey that's taking 100 days, it takes a while. That we're looking at goods that left Asia three and a half months ago, for example. Here, we look at an indexed and averaged measure of cargo ready date to when does it leave Asia, which gives us a more timely indicator of this. And now you see an unambiguous improvement um, over recent months. That, that has gotten notably better. Again, not quite back to where it was um, at the onset of the pandemic in the early days, but, but significantly better than it was. All right, we are essentially out of time, but I'm gonna, let's, let's go through, I wanna do a poll. Um, so I wanna ask everyone in the minute or so remaining. Um, and the poll is going to be, you should have it up. Um, what is your biggest concern in the year ahead? Is it consumer demand falling off? Is it rising interest rates? Is it that inflation keeps going up? That, the, that we'll have a resurgence of the pandemic? Um, or is it that you're gonna have to deal with more supply chain disruptions um, with uh, ports, shipping, warehousing, all failing to clear? So um, thank you for those of you who have voted. We're going to close with this. I know, I apologize. I always say we're gonna get to Q&A and then we get uh, <laughs> talking about lots of these things. Um, I do want to know, while you're filling out this poll, and it looks like the leader at the moment is consumer demand falling off, but inflation's giving it a run for the money, as it were. Um, inflation is surging. No, um, the uh, interesting, it's, it's interesting to see that this is, actually, I, your response has been fascinating on all these polls because we get a degree of balance um, in this, which I think, I'll, whether you mean it this way or not, we'll take it as validation of our point that, you know, this is a complicated time where you have a lot of indicators pointing in different directions. And we thought the best we could do was to keep you fully informed about this. Let me close, uh, if we go forward one slide on this, um, with just a note that uh, that Flexport is organizing, um, continuing to raise donations to send shipments of relief supplies to refugees from the crisis in Ukraine, um, we'll have a link in the chat if you'd like to learn more about this. All right. Um, so with that, we are at the end of our time. We want to be respectful of all of your time. We thank you, everyone, for joining us. Thank you, Chris, for, for uh, playing this all out with me. We're going to email out the slides, and we'll have a link 
um, to this recording tomorrow morning. Um, we'll also drop a short feedback survey into the chat. Please take a moment to share your thoughts and feedback with the team so we can continue to curate great content for you. Um, thank you all for joining us and have a great day.